Hello everyone, it's Uber from Fairlight like Tarot. Welcome to my channel. Today we're going to have a look at my favorite tarot and oracle pairings for the month of May. So this is my favorite activity on a monthly basis, I need to say, because it's also something that pairs up really well with my YouTube channel. I really like to show the tarot community the new decks sometimes I get into my collection, but I also like to show them when pairing them up with other decks. And if you've been following my channel for a while, you will know that I do this, I integrate pairings into my practice because I always feel feel that a pairing would actually give me the possibility to interpret the cards in a different way. And this is due to the fact that when you use two decks combined, it's almost as if you were having a conversation with friends. But let's have a look. So today I'm going to start with this deck. This is the European Goddesses and Spirits Oracle deck by Johanna Pola. This deck is actually funding right now on Kickstarter. And I have to say that by the time of filming, this deck has already reached its goal. I think even two, three times over, I'm not entirely sure. But this has been a really popular campaign and I am very, very pleased about it. I talked about this deck in my best Kickstarter campaign of 2024 so far. Um, the campaign was launched on the 1st of May and ever since then I've seen a lot of YouTubers talking about this deck, a lot of people posting uh, photos on Instagram and it's been an absolute joy to have a look at these cards and talk about them in my videos as well. So this deck actually comes with, as you can see, a little white book, even though I have to say, saying little white book, it feels almost as if you were not paying it justice because this is an incredibly comprehensive kind of book, let's say. And uh, you do have a lot of information on the cards. You don't have the images of the cards on the pages, but it doesn't matter because of course we have the cards for that. One thing that you can actually add to the campaign is the guidebook, the larger guidebook, and this is an absolute fantastic instrument to use. This one does have, as you, as you can see, the full page with the illustration of the cards. It does have a lot of information and let's say 75% of this you will be able to find it on the little white book. But there's also a lot of um, different uh, layers that you can use in your reading. So for example, here we can say um, correspondences connecting with Brownwen, the story, Starling and Raven. There's journaling prompts, and you get to know so many really useful things about the background behind these goddesses and spirits in order for you to be able to connect even more with the cards when you use them. But this is a video in which I'm actually talking about pairings. So let's have a look at which tarot decks I'm using together with the goddesses, European goddesses and spirits oracle deck. One of the decks that I really enjoy pairing up with this deck is the Blood Moon Tarot. Let's have a look. So as usual, I'm just gonna do... Uh, so, sorry, uh, this is a 40 cards deck. I don't remember if I mentioned that. Generally speaking, I would prefer to have at least 44 cards. But there's also something else to say. So Johanna made sure to explain in her campaign that she wanted to talk exclusively about European goddesses and spirits. Uh, Johanna is based in Germany and therefore her background is European. And she believes that the best way to talk about a subject is when you actually know the subject because you are part, it's part of your own roots. And I strongly believe in that. There's a lot of uh, oracle cards focusing on uh, goddesses from all around the world. But I think this is the first time in which we can actually see something as focused as this deck. Now, let's have a look at how it pairs up with the Blood Moon Tarot. And let me just zoom in so we can see the cards a bit better. As you can see, it's a match made in heaven. I have been enjoying these two together for the whole month and I have to say that it's mostly because of the aesthetics. But obviously when you get to look at the cards, you also on an intuitive level understand the connections between the stories. So it's not just perhaps the color palette that is very similar and not just the art style, but it's also the fact that the vibes that these two decks have have actually a lot in common. 
And I really, really like that. For example, in many, many occasions, you can tell um, how the directionality itself of the cards point to a different layer. I absolutely love pairing these two together. It's been one of my favorite activities. I have to say the Blood Moon Tarot is one of my favorite decks, tarot decks in this case. And it's been for a few years, it's been on my shelves and I was trying to find an Oracle deck that paired well with this deck. And I couldn't really find it. Although I have to say in some cases I, would, I was going really, really close. But I really recognize now that this is the best pairing, or at least the European Goddesses and Spirits Oracle is definitely the best Oracle deck to pair up with the Blood Moon Tarot, at least out of the decks that I have in my collection. I don't know if you have the Blood Moon Tarot, but I would be curious to know if you pair it up with a different Oracle deck, because I'm always hunting for good pairings, you know me. So such an amazing pair. Just a couple of more cards. So with the chariot and the devil. Wow, this is very potent. So another deck though that I really discovered actually just recently when I was looking into pairing up the um, European Goddesses and Spirits Oracle is this one, the Unfolding Path Tarot by Athena Noctua. This is the mass market edition. I know that this deck was originally published as an independent deck, and I think that this is indeed, yes, from Hay House. So you probably know Hay House, and chances are that you have at least one of their decks. Uh, chances are you probably have the Light Seer's Tarot which is also, of course, in my collection. And these are the backs, by the way. Even pairing up the backs has been really, really satisfying, as you can see. But I really believe that these two together add up to the meaning of the reading. And it's always a really nice and fulfilling experience when that happens. So in this case, as you can see, there's also similarities when it comes to the color palette. There's similarities when it comes to the art style. And even though I have to say both these have very busy kind of representation and drawings in the cards, it doesn't feel overwhelming. Sometimes, and you know what I mean, uh, there are decks that are so overwhelming. Uh, they are really full of symbols. And sometimes you really need to take your time when you look at the cards because even though sometimes uh, when you look at the card, of course, you see the title and you see, for example, this is the Nine of Wands. And we all know the meaning of the Nine of Wands. So you don't necessarily need to look at all of the elements on the card. I always highly recommend it because there's always a reason behind the choices made by a creator. It's always referring back to something and... Uh, even in minimalist decks, even more so, I would say, in minimalist decks, because we can see the reasoning behind the choice of one symbol, or perhaps even the absence of a certain symbol that we're actually kind of used to see in a card can tell us a lot about the choices made. So these two are really beautiful together. And if you remember what I was talking about earlier about directionality, in this case, this to me really speaks volumes because it tells me that there is this sense of looking forward. So we've got Giovanna between the Nine of Cups, for example, and the Empress. And this is literally telling me that there is this really powerful sense of foreboding, sense of going forward and having achieved something, but a necessity together with this achievement to also give back to the community. And Nine of Cups, that is on its own, it doesn't represent the end of a journey. You are most certainly at the last stages, but not everything has been completed yet. I really, really appreciate these two almost as much as the Blood Moon Tarot as a pairing. But I'll be very curious to know what you think about these two together, if you do prefer the Blood Moon Tarot or the Unfolding Path. I have to say the Unfolding Path is quickly becoming one of my go-to decks when I'm giving an actual reading to clients or to my members. 
because it feels like it's really spot on and it's also a very beautiful deck it's very inclusive as well and i have to say um it is very balanced sometimes well i would say that most of my decks have a predominant feminine energy um the unfolding path even though it's not necessarily a masculine kind of deck it does have a bit of a balance when it comes to these two powerful forces and i really do appreciate that I've seen a lot of people um, maybe comparing, I would say, the unfolding path to the light seer star in the sense that they probably want to occupy the same space. And I have to say that at the beginning, I was probably one of those people that thought that you, you didn't really need both of these decks. But now that I do have both, I have to say I really enjoy both of them. And I enjoy using them. And even though... I probably do use them for the same kind of in the same kind of space. It is always very nice to find differences between the two of them. I have another deck though that I want to show you paired up with the European goddesses and spirits. And we're going to have a look at it in a second. So let me just put these cards back. So I'm talking about this deck here, which is the Mythos Tarot. Let me just zoom out a bit because it is bigger. It comes in a bigger box. So this deck is published by Rockpool. Um, I think it was released about a year ago. It's by Helena Elias. And I have to say, Rockpool, when it comes to tarot decks, there's not that many, if you think about it. Uh, they do have, I believe, a contract with Sam Rook. Uh, I'm not entirely sure whether it's a tying contract, but I do know that many of her decks have been published by Rockpool. Um, this one, I honestly, I have to confess that I don't really know this creator, Helena Elias, Elias, um, but I really do like the art style of this deck. And I've talked about this deck when I was trying to find a way to have a deck that was talking about Greek mythology without having to purchase some really expensive out of print and hard to find decks such as the Tarot of Delphi, for example. So this is a really valid mass market alternative. It is very affordable. Rakpo is an Australian publisher uh, but I do believe that they release decks at the same time all over all around the world, probably not in some countries. I'm sorry about that. Sometimes I tend to forget that Australia is not in the worst position. There are countries that do receive decks even months later than in Australia, but we're definitely not up on par with the US. In the US, you do get the publications out of your dwelling and US games, especially, um, you know, as the first country. In Australia, sometimes we have to wait three to six months to achieve, to get those stacks. But I was um, chatting with someone from Argentina and from Brazil, and they were saying that sometimes they don't even get those stacks distributed at all, which is really a pity because I know for a fact that there is a very thriving tarot community in South America. But going back, getting back to these two decks, I really love how these two interact with each other. The art style is different, and I have to say that if we just focus on the art style, I would probably refer back to the Blumen Tarot as the best tarot deck to pair up with the European Goddesses and Spirits Oracle. But when it comes to the intensity of the cards and also the similarity between the borders, for example, which is sometimes contributing to a pleasing aesthetics, I think that these two actually have a very strong conversation together. And I have to say that I don't mind admitting when I'm wrong about a deck because when I first talked about the Mythos Tarot, I was also saying that I wasn't really entirely convinced by the beauty, the picture-perfect beauty, let's say, of the characters on the cards. I couldn't, I failed to see a lot of diversity when it comes to especially um, body diversity, body shape. Um, and I, st I, I still believe that, even though there's a lot of close-ups, so we cannot be entirely sure. Um, but what I believe is that this is actually done on purpose, not necessarily just to achieve the sense of aest aestheticism, but also because in this case, when we look at the cards, we don't necessarily focus on the persons, you know, the people represented, but on the meanings that they want to represent. 
And I also really appreciate that there's always the name. So this is referring back to, as I was saying, the Greek mythology. And I really appreciate the fact that we can see the names of the uh, specific uh, gods, uh, goddesses represented on the cards. For example, the seven of coins, we can see here Calliope. And for the emperor, we got Zeus in between the Baba Yaga. <laughs> That's a very nice combination as well. As I was saying, these two are really, really beautiful together and I've been really happy to use them because they've given me some really intense and powerful uh, readings. Just another couple of combinations here. We got Seeking, for example, between the Page of Wands and the Page of Swords. Such a beautiful, beautiful deck. But let's have a look at the other decks that I have been using in pairings in the month of May. So this month I have also been using these two decks together and the reason why I am really appreciative of this pairing is because I have been using the self-love tarot a lot in regards to the journey that I've taken and we are taking together with my Starlight members. It's a journey of healing and it's a journey in which we are trying to understand what the cage that, that keeps us in is made of and we're also trying by doing that and identifying the the elements inside and outside the cage, we're also trying to slowly liberate ourselves and reach the road to freedom. Um, obviously, this is very specific and it's very subjective as well, but the self-love tarot has really helped me understand the prison that I see as a physical prison, the, the elements that change throughout your life and reaching a certain age and understanding that I'm not 20 anymore, I'm not even 30. And so um, at this stage, it's also very important, important to be compassionate towards ourselves and to be kind and accepting. And I think that the self-love tarot really gave me that possibility and for a while I have been using this deck on its own but then I found out that it pairs really really well with the wisdom of the elders oracle. This is a deck that has been published by Hay House whereas the self-love tarot is an indie deck but let me just show you how lovely these two are together. And um, by the way, I always say this as a disclaimer, there is nudity in this deck. However, as I always like to say when talking about this deck, is this nudity is not aggressive, is not perceived as weaponized, and it's not, I, I believe that it's not a triggering kind of nudity. However, I feel like I have to disclose that just in case nudity may be of a triggering factor for you. So the Wisdom of the Elders Oracle, I actually got this deck and these are the backs, by the way. Let me just show you the backs of the self-love tarot as well. These are actually really beautiful together as well. So I actually got the wisdom of the Elder's Oracle back when uh, we went through, uh, let's say, Halloween. I cannot call it Samhain because it, Halloween does not correspond to Samhain in Australia. We are in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, we have just passed our Samhain because it was, uh, you know, the first days of May. Um, but when it was during Halloween, I do follow the Northern Hemisphere tradition of believing and feeling that the veil is really uh, thinning and is gradually being lifted. So it is the moment of the year in which you can actually reach out to your elders, your ancestors, your lineage, and you can also receive their messages. And so I actually prepared a very powerful ritual that I followed last year. I also uh, posted a video about it and I really, I found this so very helpful that I want to repeat it this year as, this year as well. But just to show you how beautiful these two are together, I'm, as usual, I'm just gonna break them in two, you know, and just put the tarot decks on the side and then we're just gonna level um, these two. This is not the only way of using a pairing. Um, I reckon this is probably the most popular way but by no means the only one. You can also, you know, do it this way with just having two piles of uh, the two decks side by side or using uh, two oracle cards and two tarot cards. It doesn't matter. It is something that uh, to a certain extent it also means, it also needs to be 
on an intuitive level. So if you feel that a certain method is actually really helpful for you, I would say just go for it. I just wanted to stop and show you how beautiful these are together. So we have the Three of Swords, which is obviously communicating a certain situation of anxiety. Now, the Three obviously is the growth and the suit of the mind. So there is that sense of uh, following the Two of Swords in which you couldn't really take a decision and you waited for too long and now you don't have everything um, at, your, at your fingertips anymore. You don't have the knowledge that you needed and your mind is just trying to grow grasp as straws because you, your um, anxiety is growing exponentially while things feel like they're spiraling out of control. It's not at the point of the nine of swords because the nine of swords is obviously three times three. So it, it does represent the maximum evolution of that sense of growth, but it is already pointing to a very unpleasant kind of situation. So we've got this sense of anxiety that we have in the Three of Swords, but then you see these two cards, they both uh, represent a bird. Uh, so in this case, we're looking at an eagle. In this case, it's a stylized kind of bird. But this is the Knight of Wands, and the Knight of Wands gives us the sense of that spark, of that sense of movement, which is always, um, per always pertaining to the Knights in the evolution of the core cards. The Knight is the most active one. It's obviously representing the stage in which you think you have learned everything in your page apprenticeship, and you're ready to go out and battle. Obviously, uh, when you combine that to the element of fire, which is of the uh, of the suit of, of the wands, you also have uh, that in spades. You have that energy in spades. You go out for it. You're a go-getter. And the archetype in this case is also the archetype of the adventurer because they're all, always going out of the way, getting out of their comfort zone. But there is a sense of calm that is actually coming from the love card and represented by the ego. There is this sense of trustworthy. There is this sense of being at home within ourselves. So this seems to be telling you that there is some kind of uh, getting back your energies after having depleted uh, all of your resources during the crisis um, of the Three of Swords. And before you can actually tackle the world again, you have this sense of finding inner peace and love within yourself, thanks to the ego. So as we go on with the cards, we can see that there is a lot that these two decks have in common, even though they do stand alone. They have their own vibes. This is more of a cooperation. I have many, many ways in which to describe pairings. And I always like to say that the cards like to build up a conversation with each other. And I also like to say that these conversations are built as some kind of a figurative bridge. So there is this sense of transaction, this sense of movement between the tarot cards and the oracle cards and vice versa. In this case, I would say that these two pair up together because they have their own powerful stance on things. So they do present you with the situation. However, by listening to what they have to say, you have an additional help. We have, for example, the Nine of Pentacles, um, honesty with save the Bigfoot, for example, and the Two of Wands. Now, there is that sense of the Nine of Pentacles not being the total conclusion of your suit of Pentacles. So you haven't reached the, uh, the end of the journey yet. As we say, the Nine is always the last stage, but is not the end of the journey. So there is the sense of developing that richness, that windfall that comes your way, developing it in such a way that at first you keep it for yourself and you splurge perhaps, but you also have the need to look around yourself with the two wants and understanding that perhaps in order to reach that time that you want, because it's, it is your target and it is the end of the journey, you need to expand, expand and branch out. And you can do that only exclusively by being honest with yourself. So as you can see in this case, I like to read the two tarot cards together and then I like to see, to look at them under a different lens or through a different pair of glasses thanks to the powerful messages of the oracle cards. 
So one last one, we've got the Six of Pentacles and Death. So in this case, there is the sense of transaction of ending and starting again, uh, which is intrinsical to both the Six of, Six of Pentacles and the Death card. And in this case, we also reminded that there is this sense of creation. The Great Spirit with the Creator coming from the Oracle card reminds us that the cycle of life and the yin and the yang are extremely important in order to be able to complete a cycle, but also start again with a new one. Hence, there, there is, as you can see, there is this sense of communication between the cards. And I really like the death card from the self-love oracle as well. And one last one, let's see. So we've got the element, the alchemical element of water with the keyword affirmation between the nine of wands and the chariot card. It's very beautiful. Let's have a look at another couple of decks. So next week with my Sunlight and Starlight members, we're going to start a Down the Rabbit Hole deck study group on the Sacred Chi Tarot by Madeva Padma. And so in the last couple of days, I've actually found myself already down the rabbit hole with this deck and the research about bibliography that we can use, we can, you know, uh, support our studies with. And I have to say, it's been an incredibly rewarding kind of exercise because Madhava Patma is absolutely incredible. And I believe that, uh, oh, sorry, I forgot to mention Madhava Patma is actually the illustrator of the Osho Zen Tarot, um, one of the most popular um, decks of all times, I would say. So the Sacred Sheet Tarot is a deck that has been published, if I'm correct, at the beginning of this year, or at least that's when I had the, the opportunity to acquire this deck. I did buy it when I was in Italy. So uh, this edition is by, it is a mass market deck. It's by Beyond Worlds Atria paperback. I'm not entirely sure that, I, this is completely legitimate by the way, but I I think that there might be different editions, or at least when it comes to different languages of this deck, you may find that they have been published by different um, uh, editors. So this is a deck that reminds me a lot of the Osho Zen when it comes to the particular art style that has been used for this deck. As you can see, if you're familiar with the Osho Zen Tarot, you would definitely see how similar this card is to other cards on the Osho Zen Tarot. I have to say though, there is, and this one as well, for example, but I have to say there is an evolution in the art style, which I really appreciate. And sometimes it is part of studying and admiring a deck, being able to find, for example, the differences between two decks that have been created with such a long interval in between the two of them, because the Osho Zen Tarot is from uh, decades ago. So obviously by comparing the Osho Zen and the Sacred Shi, we would be able to see see the journey that the creator herself has been through. And that in itself is very rewarding and very, it's also a lot of fun, I have to say. The Osho Zen Tarot was instrumental in my way to read tarot. I have to say that until the Osho Zen Tarot, I uh, let's say I was always sticking to the traditional RWS interpretation of the cards, but the keywords especially, and also combining the keywords with the images of, of the Osho Zen, gave me an additional layer of interpretation that I really, really appreciate. Now, I was looking for an oracle deck that would pair well with this tarot deck, and I have to say I was really struggling. Uh, obviously, this is a work in progress in the sense that we are starting the uh, deck study uh, next week. So if you want to join us, you'll be more than welcome. We also share everything on Facebook and it's a really fun way to feel also the community. At a certain point, one of my members actually suggested pairing it up with this deck. So this is the Narrative Alchemy Tarot by Chrissy Bentley. And technically speaking, this is actually a tarot deck. So as you can see, the Narrative Alchemy Tarot doesn't say Oracle. However, for the very specific way in which this deck is set up, as you can see, it's a color. The colors are actually, if you want, you can group them up and you can assign them to the colors of the chakras. And each and every card, 
for example, here has got a well, a full uh, full color of the card, and then you have a keyword, and then you have a number and a symbol, an alchemical symbol. I don't know if you can see. It's this one here. So the number 14 is referring to the 14th card in a minor suit of a tarot deck. So in that case, it will be a king. And the alchemical element of air, well, is obviously referring to the suit of swords or the suit of air, as we call it as well. So you can totally read with this deck as if it were a tarot deck. However, because the keywords are very powerful, I actually like to pair it up with other tarot decks as if this were an oracle deck. And let me show you how these two actually really, really pair up well together. So as always, we're going to put the oracle in the middle and we're going to level the decks out and we just what i do is i actually don't pay much attention uh, to the number and the alchemical element at the bottom of the card because that would definitely uh, remind me of the meaning of the card as in the tarot meaning of the card but i actually choose to focus on the keyword in the center of the card so what we've got here because this deck also has keywords, we have three keywords we can work it with. And I find it really, really interesting. So we got ease between focus and fear. Obviously, when we focus too much, that can produce overwhelm. And we need to, sometimes we need to take a step back and ease that focus in order to be overcoming the sense of fear that we can get from a situation. Or equilibrium between disappointment and voyager we understand that in this case i immediately know that it's referring to the five of cups because there is a number five and there's also the color blue which is referring to the suit of cups so i understand what the disappointment is about and i also understand how to apply the keyword equilibrium to this kind to this disappointment we need to understand that there's a balance and in particular in the five of cups we also need to understand not everything is lost so if you do have five cups at the origin and you lose three or you lose two, you still have something left. Find that kind of balance, find that kind of equilibrium, and then you can actually start again on your journey that was, you know, stop for a sense of disappointment that you had. Or fruition between inspiration and blame. That's a really powerful combination of keywords. And so on and so forth. And one other way to utilize these two decks together is also to pay attention, as I was mentioning before, to the references to the colors of the chakra. Because color is definitely something you have a lot and you feel a lot of vibes on, coming from these both these decks. Because as you can see, um, even the, the sacred sheet tarot has a lot of really powerful and saturated colors on the cards. We got confidence between privilege and indulgence. And that there's a beautiful message that, that we sometimes need to be careful about indulging too much in the confidence provided by privilege. There's almost something, uh, you know, that we can talk for hours about, but we obviously don't have ours. Uh, wisdom, uh, methodical between wisdom and separation. I have to say, even when it comes to the feeling of these two decks together, uh, they are rather on the thin side, but as I mentioned before, there might be different edition of the Sacred Chi Tarot. Um, I know that there's also a French edition, there's also a, um, I believe a German edition, I could be wrong. And so depending on the publisher, you may have a completely different experience with the deck. My very own experience is that this deck is slightly thinner than what I would have expected. However, when I pair it up with the narrative alchemy, which is a, your typical make playing cards, because this one has been purchased by me on the make playing cards website, um, this is not a thick uh, card stock. So this actually, these two together actually feel rather similar. So even the tactile experience is not too far off. And that definitely helps in uh, tuning in. I'm a strong believer in all of applying all of the senses, you know, when you read your cards. I also like to make this kind of discoveries and finding out that there is a gradation of this particular kind of yellow in this card as well. And perhaps paying attention to that, is that suggesting something? Is that giving me a possibility to read the cards in a different way? 
that's a really really beautiful pairing i really thank the member that actually suggested these two together because they work really really well i believe that if you don't have the narrative alchemy uh, it is a very affordable deck by the way on make playing cards uh, although i have to say sometime uh, shipping costs can be prohibited it depends on where you live uh, they do ship out of the printer in Hong Kong. Um, however, there is a, an actual oracle deck that is called the Color Mage Oracle, uh, which is absolutely fantastic. And it's very similar to the Narrative Alchemy. It's an oracle deck though, so it's not a tarot deck. Um, I believe that it was out of print for a long time and only just recently it has been reprinted and it has become available again. So if you feel like a deck like this could actually be very helpful and uh, you know conducive of intuition in your readings, but you don't have this particular one or you don't like this one, I recommend checking out the Color Major Oracle. And wonderful, we got play between joy and change and how beautiful a message to conclude this video on. So always applying the playfulness of the joy that brings about the necessary change and the circle of life. Really, really powerful. Now that was it for today. Thank you so much for being with me till the end of this video. More to come. Have a great day.